Hey number one, so welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we're going to talk about, of course, Zelda Breath of the Wild, as you, as you already know from the title of the, of the video, but let me tell you that this is probably one of my favourite video games ever. Generally speaking, I don't speak about video games as much as I used to on this channel, and probably, I mean, I've recently made a video on Demon Souls, the recent a re remake of Demon Souls didn't really get many views, but to be honest, like uh, probably this video is not going to get many views either. But uh, you know, it's not always about views. I believe I mean, views are important. I'm not going to be hypocritical, but sometimes I just like talking about something I love, and I love this game to bits. So Zelda: Breath of the Wild, I think, has been. It's as you know, it's it's a launch title. It was the one of the launch titles for. Uh, the Nintendo Switch, and it was released on the 3rd of March 2017. Now, when this video game came out, I was always on YouTube watching videos, trying not to watch too many playthroughs, because I don't like spoiling my games, but I wanted to see what it looked like, and I was all about the new mechanics and the things that you could do. And yes, there are some things that I'm not a huge fan of, Particularly it wasn't at first, such as the fact that weapons break too easily for my taste, but I do understand the design. I even like, read entire interviews of the creator of the game explaining why he went for that choice, and then I kind of got used to it. It's sort of a, you know, the, the weapons break mechanic is a bit of a acquired taste, perhaps, but eventually I did start enjoying that too. It's still not one of my favourite things about the game, but one of the things that I particularly enjoy about this game is the way gear, equipment, armour specifically works. So on this video, I'd like to talk about this. Um, this game really brought an interesting perspective to the development and progression of the armour you wear. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of outfit, and in fact, rather than just saying armour, we should say outfit, because some of the armour sets that Link has in the game, they aren't armour at all. And that's why, while others are absolutely clearly armour, all the way up to full plate armour, which of course is my favourite set, as you can imagine, as you can probably guess. Um, but the thing is that the outfits that he wears, I think they came up with a great mechanic. Usually in MMORPGs and in regular RPGs, gear has a sort of progressive development in-game, meaning that you start with crap gear and crap armour, and then, you know, the more you level up, and the more you start doing jobs and, and missions and quests, whatever you want to call them, um, the, the, the better the gear you get. So you, the, you get newer armour, and the previous armour, you just sell it. This is just how it is, because it becomes useless, because now you've got armour that has better stats. Um, this is generally how RPGs tackle the uh, the question of armour. Regardless of the class, really, it can, you can be a mage, you can be a warrior, you can be a knight, you can be a paladin, it's always like this. And even rogues have this, of course, different materials, usually fantasy leather armour, perhaps some elves will have mithril. You've got lots of different things, but at the end of the day, that's the general idea. And with MMORPGs, then they have introduced the idea of colours. Well, I'm not really sure if they introduced it, because now that I think of it, even Diablo, which wasn't an MMO, the original Diablo, had a colour system, but I think it is MMORPGs that have sort of made it more of a trend that every single MMORPG uh, or the majority of them, do have this system of grey to blue to green to yellow to purple and all the other different uh, colours about weapons that are normal, magical, epic and whatnot, legendary. You end up getting like a new set of armour and you really liked the one before, you really loved the way you lo it looked, but it just makes no sense to use the previous one because you've got a better one that just has better stats. And so you just have to sell it, or sometimes you just keep it for fun, like in, in Skyrim. I love the fact that you can uh, have your mannequins at home when you build your own home. Now, some video games have tried to tackle this problem, giving you cosmetic uh, freedom, meaning that, yes, if you, if you liked the way your previous outfit looked, but you want the stats of the new one, you can just, you know, sort of copy-paste the looks of it and into the, from the old one to the new one, so you've got the new stats, but you don't lose the previous looks that you liked better, and you could do this in uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I think is the first Assassin's Creed that allows you to do that, and then, you know, you can do this in Final Fantasy XIV as well, uh, which is a great MMORPG, by the way, one of my favourite, but still, I think what The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild did is the best approach, meaning that you don't really sell your previous armour, because each different set in the game has different pros and cons. 
you've got stuff to protect you from heat that you need to wear, even though they don't have as good as defensive uh, bonuses as other kinds of outfits, but it does protect you from heat. And so when you go to an area that is too hot, you've got to switch. And then you've got stuff on the other hand of the spectrum that protects you from the cold. And therefore, if you are in a frozen area, you've got to switch up and, and then put that one on. And then you've got stuff, uh, armor that has got very good defensive stats. And that's usually what I wear when I'm fighting, uh, for example, the boss, or if I'm fighting in an area that has got mild temperature. Uh, you know, these things are great. And there are many other things, of course, that we're going to explore on this video about the sort of uh, characteristics of, of armor in this game. But I love it. Now, would that, how would that translate into the realistic situation with real uh, medieval armor, for example? And I think it's similar because at the end of the day, you don't really have, unless there is like a massive gap between like 400 years, 500 years of difference between kinds of armor, then in, in which case, of course, I don't know, late 16th century armor is obviously going to be better in from all perspectives than, um, I want to say, 12th century armor, 11th century armor. But when you look at similar centuries, uh, you still have quite a lot of variables. And the fact that we've got variables in the medieval period doesn't only mean that, you know, some people could afford better armor and some people could. And sometimes that's the case and other times it is personal preference, style, because fashion and flamboyance were also important on the battlefield for a reason that I will talk about more in detail in a, on a dedicated video. But sometimes it's also that with a specific kind of helmet, you know, if we focus on the helmet, but I'll talk about everything really, uh, you oftentimes gain protection but lose mobility. Sometimes you have better vision, uh, you breathe better with one type. Uh, with another type you're more defended, with another type you've got better mobility, other types have got in-between compromises. And that is probably one of the reasons why in the medieval period you didn't really have just one helmet. If one helmet design was just superior to every other design, everything else would have faded out. People would have just sold their whole helmets and, you know, basically what happens in real uh, MMORPGs or, or RPGs in general were old gear is just that. It's old, it's useless, you just uh, sell it. Um, but we do know that in the medieval period, there were a lot of different kinds of helmets. You get, you've got like kettle hats, which were contemporary to armlets, which were contemporary to frog mouths, sallets, bassinets, great bassinets, so secret helmets. There were so many different variants, barbutes. And generally speaking, I wouldn't say that, for example, an, an armlet or even a frog mouth is the best helmet. Uh, because it really depends what you're doing. If you are in a tournament, then I want to say probably the frog mouth is going to be the best together with a complete armet, complete with a wrapper, which is an extra layer of plate that you could put in the front, because during a jumps, during a tournament, you don't need mobility. In fact, with some frog mouths, they were attached to your breastplate and you couldn't even move your head completely. It was completely in place. Uh, why do you want that on a tournament? You want that on a tournament because first, you're not going to wear the helmet for very long. Secondly, you only need to literally go forward and look forward. Um, no one is going to attack you from the sides like it could happen on, the, on a battlefield. No one is going to shoot you for, with a bow. Uh, you just need to think and focus on the knight in front of you that is charging towards you with a lance. And considering the lance I've just mentioned, your helmet needs to provide maximum possible protection because if the lance does happen to hit you in the face, uh, it could break your neck. It could literally kill you. It could break your jaw. And therefore, a very solid, stout helmet, rigid, is going to provide best protection. Um, you, you don't really want to joust with a kettle hat because that's going to be suicidal. Uh, on the other hand, though, if you are on the battlefield, then a frog mouth, although it's not impossible to use, and early frog mouths were also used on the battlefield, at the end of the day, they do become specialized jousting gear because they don't function well in the field. At the end of the day, you need to be able to look around, you need to be able to have mobility. And an, an armet, perhaps without a wrapper, is probably a better choice if you want to have complete full protection but still maintain somewhat a good level of mobility. And a lot of knights also decided to go for a salad and a beva, which again, since there is an overbite but the two things are relatively detached, you still can uh, move your head uh, better than you could with a frog mouth. But if you were a medieval soldier, not a knight, not mounted forces, uh, you need to do many other things. And you're not going to charge into someone with a, with a horse. So the idea of using a kettle hat instead will be a better choice for you. 
Um, first, of course, again, there is price in mind, but sometimes some uh, crossbowmen, some longbowmen were quite rich. And you can tell that by just looking at the sort of full plate arms and full plate legs that sometimes these uh, ranged units could afford. And if you can afford all of that, you can afford an army. But shooting with an army would be a big problem because vision, right? And, and therefore, I think a kettle hat or a, perhaps even a barbute, if you were in Italy, would be a better choice. And, and, or even a salad, of course, for crossbowmen. I think a salad is a great choice, too. And therefore, perhaps even without the beaver. So there are a lot of options and a lot of situational cases that we need to keep in mind as to why you don't really have one single better helmet that outshines them all in all possible situations. A soldier needs to be able to build, a soldier needs to be able to march, a soldier needs to be able to function uh, as a soldier, which doesn't only involve combat. In fact, for the majority of his time, it's going to be everything else but combat. And therefore, uh, you know, other helmets would have been a better idea, a better choice. And this reflects in the Breath of the Wild. The idea of, you know, depending on where you are, that you will switch your gear. And knights did switch gear. They had lots of different possible configurations. They would switch the sort of sabatons, they would switch the sort of pauldrons, they would switch the kind of helmet they would wear, depending on what they were going to do, what kind of terrain, what kind of enemies, what kind of uh, tactics were going to be used on the field. And I love that about this game. So, of course, it's a fantasy world. So, does it need to be like that? No. But does it bring more enjoyment? Yes. And therefore, I think it's great. I mean, you know, I'm all about realism uh, when it comes to armor and weapons but only when it doesn't sort of remove fun from games. Uh, if, you know, you don't want a game to be 100% realistic and just not fun, because a game is supposed to be fun, that's the first thing. Secondly, though, the things that you can do that are more realistic, and at the same time they make the gameplay not only the same, but even better, then I'm all for that. And I think Breath of the Wild, the reason why this game shines, is because it does just that. It does something that is realistic in a fantasy game, and in the process of doing that, in the meantime, it's bringing forth a fun, original, interesting gameplay mechanic that makes the game really stand out. I love Breath of the Wild. Okay, number one, so I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up, and if you're not yet members of this community, become a number one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye. Thank you.